We're with us today, Cloris Ismaeli, who's uh, uh, a visiting scholar and a media studies uh, professor in addition to American studies. Um, Julie Carson, who uh, uh, writes a political blog, who's uh, best known as a professor of art curation. So we have a lot of different perspectives, people with different sort of background, Karim Maktasi and Daniel Wright from the PSPA, the political science department here, um, to try to sort it out. And it's been quite an election. Um, the Democrats won big, though you wouldn't know that from the narrative that's being told. Um, Tim Raphael will also be part of it. Tim Raphael is um, a professor at Rutgers in Newark, which is one of the most diverse cities in the United States, and he runs a center called Newest Americans, in which he helps um, young arrivals from all over the world create uh, media and uh, mechanisms to tell their own stories. And as you may also know, uh, immigration for good or ill was one of the main um, issues in the American um, political campaign that uh, just uh, ended and it will continue to be very important. So we'll be, uh, that will be next Thursday uh, here. We hope to see you at uh, either or both of those events. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about this one uh, today. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Catherine Maud from Winder, uh, Women and Gender Studies. Where's Catherine? Oh, yes, Thank you. Um, this would, wouldn't be uh, possible uh, were it not for her and this wonderful collaboration. We're really happy to have this uh, uh, kind of collaboration and we look forward to many more uh, like it. Um, Robert Reed Farr, who's uh, tonight's uh, guest, um, is a professor of uh, studies of women, gender, and sexuality, and um, African and African American studies at Harvard University. He was previously a distinguished, this is quite an impressive uh, bio, so bear with me here. He was previously a distinguished professor of English and American studies at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, both an assistant and associate professor of English at Johns Hopkins University, he holds a PhD in American Studies, MA in African American Studies from Yale, um, as well as a BA in Political Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, he has been the Jess and Sarah Cloud Distinguished Visiting Professor of English at the College of William and Mary, the Edward Said Visiting Chair. This is how we met eight years ago. Um, it's great to have you back. Um, uh, the Edward Said Visiting Chair of American Studies at the American University of Beirut. Um, the Drews Hines Visiting Professor of English, I told you this went on for a while. Uh, the Drew Hines Visiting Professor of English at the University of Oxford. Uh, the Carlisle and Barbara Moore Distinguished Visiting Professor of English at the University of Oregon. The Ethel Mathias and Visiting Professor of Gender and Sexuality at Harvard. Um, he's a specialist in African American culture and a prominent scholar in the field of race and sexuality studies. He's the author of four books, Conjugal Union, The Body, The House, and The Black American, which was published by Oxford University, Black, uh, Black Gay Man, Essays from uh, NYU Press, once You Go Black, um, uh, Choice, uh, Desire, and the Black American Intellectual, also from NYU Press, and Archives of Flesh, uh, African American Spain, uh, Africa America, Spain, and the Post-Humanist Critique, uh, New York um, uh, University Press 2016. Um, his essays have appeared in a wide range of uh, publications. I'll not read uh, them all to you. And in addition to that, he's a member of the editorial advisory committee of the journal Kalalu, which many of you may know if you know something about African American literature. He's a research and uh, his research and writing have been supported by grants from the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in Berlin. We were talking about it today for those of you who are looking for funding. It's a, it's a great place to look, though. It's nice to have his tradition credentials if you're looking. Um, his writing has been honored by the Publishing Triangle and the Modern Language Association. In 2015, he was inducted into the Johns Hopkins Society of Scholars. He's the recipient of a 2016 John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Brooklyn, New York. Welcome. Well, I should do a little bit of um, social engineering um, before I start. First, I want to thank you, Robert. It's a it's a nice to be here. 
Uh, I haven't been back in, um, in Beirut and Lebanon for seven years, and I got here to do and I thought, what the hell have I been thinking? It's so, it's so pleasant here, and it's such a wonderful environment to be in. So I wanted to thank you in particular, and thank you for, Vanessa, for having gotten all of this done. I think that you started your job last week or something, and so uh, it's been really amazing. Um, and then the social engineering is, I wanted to say to the people in the room over here that if you want to take this minute to actually maybe come in a little bit closer, there are actually chairs in the front because it may be a little bit difficult for you in the, in the, I think the, I think that's the official, the, the kids table. Over there. So if you want to change your position, I'll, um, I'll rustle my papers a little bit while you, while you do that. <laughs> and make busy. Um, I don't think they want to do it that way. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, so I'll do a little peekaboo thing. Um, I won't. Um, I won't do too much of a setup because this is the talk that I'm going to give you today it takes about 45 minutes. You guys can hear me in the back. Uh, the talk that I'm going to do to read to you today takes about 45 minutes to deliver. Um, effectively, I wanted to say just one quick thing about it before I begin, and that is that um, in last year, the James Baldwin Archives um, opened at the um, Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture at the, uh, the New York Public Library. So if you go to New York City, the Schomburg Center is on uh, Lenox Avenue and 135th Street. Um, those materials have not been available to us. Um, they came available 30 years after James Baldwin's death. And so um, uh, there are now people who are actually looking at them. Um, the problem that it, and the problem in the insider thing that I'll tell you is that um, the estate allows no copying of the materials and no photocopying, no uh, photographing of the materials and no photocopying of the materials. So there's 70, I'm, um, so afterwards if you want to ask me about what I know about that collection, I'll tell you. Um, uh, but it means that I have to transcribe them. Um, and so um, I, uh, I thank my mother. Um, she and I had a huge fight in 1979 uh, because she insisted that I take typing, and I did not want to take typing. Um, but she won. She won on that fight, and therefore I'm a very quick typist and uh, and uh, competent, uh, competent at my job. <laughs> um, so, um, if you want to uh, chat with me about what it is that uh, is actually in those materials, I'll let you know um, uh, what I know afterwards. Um, but I'm looking at those at them systematically. So there's 77 boxes, um, and in about a year and uh, three months of time, I've gotten to box 35. So um, I'm hoping to be able to finish it um, to get through all of the materials in about a year and a half. A quick thing about um, the essay that I'm going to uh, read to you today, the paper that I'm going to uh, deliver you to you today, is that um, I began it, um, although I finished it after I actually had access to the, some of those materials, but I began it before when uh, there was any access to the James Baldwin papers, uh, so slightly before or many of the materials, some of the things I was thinking about um, uh, come from the secondary sources. I am a bit embarrassed about by what I'm about to say. I hesitate and stutter as I prepare myself for the simple, straightforward, and none too surprising revelation that I intend to write a biography, or something approaching a biography of the famed novelist, playwright, and essayist James Baldwin. What discomfits me is not that there are already a fair number of biographical treatments of the maestro Fern Ekman's 1966, The Furious Passage of James Baldwin, W.J. Weatherby's 1989, James Baldwin, Artist on Fire, Karen Thornson's 1989 film, The Price of the Ticket, James Campbell's 1991, Talking at the Gates, Her Boyd's 2008, Baldwin's Harlem, and more important still, the key 1994 text, James Baldwin, A Biography, written by David Lehman, Baldwin's one-time assistant, and the only individual to have received full access to the Baldwin papers. Nor am I particularly troubled by either the voluminous amount of Baldwin criticism or the very many interviews, speeches, and debates of the artist recorded on film, video, audio, and, and print. What does bother me, however, what provokes that nagging embarrassment and guilt of which I have just spoken, is that I'm frankly suspicious of the practice of biographical writing. 
The idea that there's something extra, a certain je ne sais quoi, that might be ascertained by the careful student rifling through the detritus left behind in the wake of a great artist passing has always seemed to me somehow vulgar, an affront to the truth, the heft, one is wont to say, of the public archive that intellectuals, particularly progressive and politically committed intellectuals, struggle to produce and bequeath. Read a thick biography of a hero, and you're likely to find yourself trapped within a sort of textual schizophrenia stretched between biography and distrust, in which the protocols of what the late Eve said were termed paranoid reading are very much on display. We seek an essential veracity underwriting the famed individual's life, a truth understood to be obscured, hidden, and denied by the very art that our beloved forebear struggled to produce. We ask hysterically, was he or wasn't he? Did she or did she not? The stated intentions of the always already suspect subject to be damned. Still, I am a man of my times. I listen daily to the irritated drums of dissent sounding just outside my office door. I'm as aware as anyone that the nature of life, or rather the question of how to weigh and value human life, human subjectivity and ontology, especially black subjectivity and ontology, defined by discourses of race, gender, sexuality, and class, dominate the United States' political and cultural discourse. Walk in the fullness of the day through the smugly pleasant streets of a liberal New England city, and one finds hanging from all the proudest of the proud steeples, ever more grand and insistent reminders that life matters. What gives me pause, however, is not how often it, it seems that I am, in fact, the only visible representative of the particular variety of life being named, but instead that the dialogue that the banners are meant to provoke seems to be one in which I can never fully participate, in which I am an object to be discussed, but never a subject to be directly hailed or interpolated. I suspect, then, that there's something profoundly complex about the announcement of life, black life, gay life, queer life, female life, working life, intellectual life, within popular culture, the culture of biography, that it is wildly important to examine and understand as we try to stumble through difficult and interesting times towards something approximating the beloved community. I will amend my earlier claims then to say that my desire is not so much to reveal the truth of James Baldwin as it is to understand the nature, the history, if you will, of his celebrity. I want to know what it is that motivates our interest in understanding the hidden scripts that reveal the logic of the connections between his public persona and what we name with only a bit of winking his personal life. Even as I turn to the wealth of archival materials that Baldwin left in his wake, I recognize that what drives the will to unveil and truly know Baldwin is not so much the belief that there are some remarkable secrets waiting to be told, but instead that we all somehow clumsily and only are, are, are clumsily and only half consciously aware that the means by which one might announce and analyze life, including black, female, and queer life, are at once awkward and imprecise, politicized and vulgar. Indeed, we can only begin the process of coming to understand the nature of human life by attempting to access those deeply complex historical <coughs> and ideological structures that demarcate the presumed limits of what it is possible for us to know and imagine. I should say here that my thinking on these matters is largely dependent upon the work of those many individuals who have attempted to theorize the complexity of the political ethical, discursive, ideological, cultural, social, biological, morass looped, lumped inelegantly under the label human. Speaking of the generative tension that lies between man and the human animal body that supports this concept, Giorgio Agamben writes that, quote, man exists historically only in this tension. He can be human only to the degree that he transcends and transforms the anthropophorous animal which supports him 
and only because through the action of negation he is capable of mastering and eventually destroying his own animality. It is in this sense that Kojak can write that man is a fatal disease of the animal, end quote. The strange neologism Anthropophorus holds my attention in this passage. Agamben names the man-bearing animal, a creature that though proximate to and intimate with man should never be seen or hailed. To do so would risk revealing the obvious lie of a fundamental distinction between man and man-bearer. It would disrupt the action of negation It would disrupt the action of negation, the pursuit of mastery and destruction that Agamben suggests as a primary engine of modern society. Man exists, he transforms and transcends, masters and destroys. It seems, in fact, that man's never-ending attempts to confront and destroy animality sponsor the flexibility, creativity, and vigor necessary for his ever-proliferating creative projects. In contrast, the anthropophorous animal does only one thing. It supports. Irritatingly, it consistently fails to perform the only other task that has ever been asked of it. It will not die. Or to state the matter as plainly as I can continue, the continued dominance of man over woman, white over black, master over slave, colonizer over colonized, has never been simply a matter of avarice but also an artifact of a set of complex ideological structures in which the most vulgar forms of abuse and exploitation are made to appear natural, inevitable, as things never to be noted or remarked. What indeed, what is needed from people of color, females and queers, is not only that we unceasingly support the projects of so-called Western humanism, not only that we not resist, but also that we never announce in our speech, our bearing, the complexity of our culture, that anything is amiss. One must learn to take a punch and not say ouch. Here, I mean to do nothing more complicated than to name the structure of the shocking fear and hostility between black and white, female and male, immigrant and native, that one might readily see by turning the knobs on one's television set to the on position that marks my age. <laughs> Again, the battles that we witness taking place are at once structural and ideological. Or to rush toward one of my major claims, the hostility directed toward the black, the brown, the female, the queer, the very hostility that is so easily and innocently announced from the grandest of the United States as many grand stages is in large part driven by an only partially recognized or understood anxiety created by the fact that subordinate communities, anthropophorous animals all, seem to be willingly abandoning their traditional roles, retreating from their supporting postures. The virulence one hears in our presidents railing against the blacks in the ghettos is a product not so much of a hatred of black individuals and communities, though hatred of plenty there is, but instead an inchoate fear that once those individuals and communities have escaped their bounds and quit their traditional responsibilities, there could not be any stable ground on which to announce the peculiarity and the pre preciousness of the ever so reverently worshiped totems of American culture, wealth, whiteness, masculinity, one should always remember then that the winds of change do not move us all in the same, at the same speeds or in the same directions. The genius of James Baldwin was that he got remarkably close to understanding the mechanics of all this. He understood particularly during the period between 1954 and 1970 when this US civil rights movement was at full throttle the progressive intellectuals needed to hail and defend the structural changes then taking place in the United States, while also modeling new forms of subjectivity and intersubjectivity for individuals and communities with no clear understanding 
of how they might continue to operate in a world in which basic social protocols were being called into question. He had, that is, to address the matter of what black and white identity actually were or could be. Once the fetters binding the two together began to fray and rot. The difficulty, however, that he was that he was hardly alone on this particular playing field. No matter the eloquence of his speech or the clarity of his vision, he was never fully in control of the protocols of celebrity that helped to establish and maintain his career. It's not only that we treat Baldwin celebrity as a script that might be adequately unpacked using the standard tools of literary and cultural criticism, but also that we recognize that much of the fascination with Baldwin's person, a fascination that peaked with the November 17, 1962 publication of Letter from a Region of My Mind and the New Yorker, and began to win as early as 1968 with the lukewarm reception of his fourth novel, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, was itself yet another example of the fretful nature in which American culture continuously announces, consumes, discards, and recycles presumably new visions of black subjectivity, new Negro hood, if you will, as part of an effort to celebrate specifically American forms of modernity and forward thinking, while also disallowing disruptions of hegemonic and commonsensical notions of the proper limits to individual and community. In a remarkable set of eight articles published in the Boston Globe between April 14th and April 21st, 1963, journalist Brad Rollins lays out for his readers what would quickly become the standard narrative of Baldwin's life. Rollins informs us that Baldwin was a boy preacher whose incredible abilities to inspire, exhort, and testify were very much on display in both his prose and his public speaking. He then explained Baldwin's desperate need to escape the vulgar racism of New York and New Jersey for the considerably less hostile environment of Paris. And perhaps even more importantly, it was while Baldwin lived in France from 1948 to 1956 that he became aware of the fact that he was as American as any white Texan. <laughs> We're reminded as well that Baldwin was a relentlessly truthful writer one who often did his best work in the wee hours of the morning. Still, as even the most casual student of Baldwin and his work will surely recognize, Rollins tells us very little that Baldwin himself did not continually announce and rehearse throughout the course of his long and distinguished career. What I find truly fascinating about the articles, however, is the information placed at the margins. Indeed, even as the process of lionization starts to wear thin to sound tinny and grating on the ear, Rollins, a Pulitzer-nominated reporter and columnist for the Boston Globe and later an editor with the New York Times, and the executive editor of the Amsterdam News, the Amsterdam News is the major black newspaper in the United States, clearly understood that Baldwin's celebrity was not simply a factor of the author's many talents, but also a multifaceted and communal effort to find an articulate representative of mid-20th century African-American political and social insurgency. In the last of the articles published on April 21, 1963, Rollins quotes William Sean, the famously reticent editor of The New Yorker from 1952 to 1987 on Baldwin and his essay, Letter from a Region in My Mind. We at The New Yorker do not print articles of opinion. And if we had looked upon Baldwin's piece as being that, we would have not have published it, Sean begins. However, we considered it to be, in a highly unorthodox way, news. We regularly run letters from Paris, letters from London and Berlin, and so on. And we decided to call this article, Letter from a Region in My Mind, to convey our feeling that this article was, indeed, a report on what was going on in one area of James Baldwin's mind. It's, it's funny to me. It's totally funny. And, then, and thus possibly on what was going on in the minds of many Negro Americans. Baldwin, because of his special literary powers, was able to express something that has been vaguely sensed by many people for a long time, though never put into words. It required his particular combination of poetry, social situations, <coughs> eloquence, and passion to describe what it is to be a Negro in America today. We were all aware that the piece would probably stand as some kind of event historically. 
This central experience of being Negro in present day America has now been recorded once and for all, and it had to be done by a Negro. It had to come from someone who had gone through it." End quote. I fear that the only way that one can read these lines is to read them badly. <laughs> the theatrical certainty that Sean Marshall's in defense of his decision to publish a letter from a region of my mind provokes one to fits of sophomoric giggling. Baldwin's piece is not opinion, but news. His mind is a district much like Paris, London, and Berlin. More remarkable still, Sean claims presumably that neither, with neither fingers nor toes crossed, that Baldwin's trenchant and beautifully rendered critique had never before been put into words. This is though by the early 1960s, <coughs> the Wright had published Native Son, Black Boy, The Outsider, Savage Holiday, The Long Dream, and A. <coughs> Ralph Ellison had won the 1953 National Book Award for Invisible Man and published many of the essays that would be collected in his 1964 collection, Shadow and Ant. Lorraine Hansberry's wildly successful play, Raisin in the Sun, made her in 1959 the first black female and playwright to have her work mounted on Broadway, while Gwendolyn Brooks's Annie Allen had won the 1950 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Even the ever prolific Langston Hughes had in 1958 published his selected poems a collection that Baldwin himself reviewed. The point of all this, those eight articles penned by Rollins and the rare interview with William Shawn, was in fact to remark Baldwin as at once representative and peculiar, archetypal and odd, the very conceptual monstrosity we conjure when we use the word synecdoche. The central experience of being a Negro in present day America has now been recorded once and for all, we are informed. The profound shift in black subjectivity and ontology that followed quick on the heels of the 1954 Supreme Court Brown versus Topeka Board of Education decision, which ended state-sponsored segregation, had been accounted for with but a single, with, with but a single voice. And the process, both the New Yorker and the smug self-satisfaction that it continues to represent were reaffirmed and re-stabilized. If you have followed my arguments thus far, you will understand that part of what I attempt here is to name Baldwin himself as a sort of rarefied anthropophorous animal. Even and especially as he is celebrated as exceptional and an exceptional, even superior black individual, his celebrity is built at least in part on the ways in which he is imagined to announce and support protocols of racial, race and racialism that have been once modernized and invigorated. Thus the many profiles, interviews, and photographs of the artist can be said to be soothing for his audiences, evidence that the potential radicalism within the, la the latest articulation of new Negro identity might be channeled through a lucid spokesman capable of translating so-called black rage into registers that might be understandable to the middle row elites associated with the New Yorker. Thus the appearance of the author's smiling face on the May 17, 1963 cover of Time magazine announces a sort of liberal relief and hopefulness, a belief that by acknowledging the logic and depth of feeling embedded in both Letter from a Region of My Mind and the classic 1963 work, The Fire Next Time, there might be a chance to usher in an era of desegregation without terribly disrupting the basic political, social, and economic structures. Or to state the matter gracelessly, by celebrating the eloquence and elegance of James Baldwin, the country might be able to ignore the contradiction made apparent by the fact that Baldwin's fire-breathing essay in The New Yorker was printed alongside an advertisement for a $150,000 set of pearls. As a theoretical matter, however, I'd like to push beyond Agamemnon's extremely clever concept of anthropophorous animality by suggesting that the fixity, indeed the brittleness of the idea, begins to give way when we place it within the specific historical, social, and cultural context that produced James Baldwin. I will say from the outset that what, when I first read Agamben on this matter, 
I was reminded of nothing more exotic than New World slavery. There's a wealth of material, both modern and ancient, that speaks to the idea of the black non-subject as a sort of only half-articulate being, one that supports the clear expression of dominant culture and society without somehow ever really participating in it. There is also an equally broad body of work that demonstrates the ways in which the messy living humanity of enslaved persons constantly disrupted the proper manifestation of these same protocols. Each time the black is imaged, the rules of engagement ever so slightly slip and falter. In the case of James Baldwin, his status as a representative Negro had to be filtered through both his race radicalism and the matter of his difficult prose and his queer, never quite properly tamed body. Take too many photographs or conduct too many interviews of and with the author of the 1956 classic homosexual novel, Giovanni's Room, or the even more disruptive 1962 work, Another Country, and one is very likely to be forced to rethink what type and quality of support this representative Negro is in fact able to offer. The many celebratory profiles of Baldwin written after 1962 are marked by a remarkable amount of clumsiness, uncertainty, derision, and indeed fear in the descriptions that they offer. Baldwin is inevitably described as slight, ugly, fey, and nervous, even as he is ceremoniously hailed as an extraordinary <coughs> intellectual and a vibrant leader of his race. In an astonishing dispatch written by Roger Stone of Time Magazine, entitled The Shadow Was a Nigger, Take One, and posted from the magazine's San Francisco Bureau on May 9, 1963, we find a bewilderingly clear expression of the surprise and anxiety that Stone experienced when witnessing Bal the Baldwin legend in the flesh. Quote, James Baldwin was an eloquent pixie with a sharp tongue, no, excuse me, I'll begin again. James Baldwin, an eloquent pixie with a sharp tongue, is fond of telling a beautiful story with a quick twist. One of his current stable is about how he was walking along a quiet street in a pretty town on a sunshiny day. As he strolled along, he suddenly saw, on a quiet patch of green lawn, a father swinging his tiny, pretty daughter in the air. It didn't last for more than a second, says Baldwin but it was an uncomfortable and unforgettable touch of beauty, a glimpse of another world. Then I looked down and saw a shadow. The shadow was a nigger, me." End quote. You will forgive me if I'm not fully able to collect myself at this juncture. It is not so much that I'm offended but it said that there is no proper or predictable way for me to read and unpack the codes that structure the logic of these seven surprisingly simple sentences. Is an elegant pixie a faggot? Are beautiful stories with sharp twists, black queer nonsense to quiet streets and green lawns on which fathers swing tiny pretty daughters in the air to speak some unspoiled white nirvana? The only Certainty here is that shadows and niggers are one and the same. But even this bit of stability is undermined by Stone's report that it is James Baldwin himself who has provided this staggeringly unruly prose. It's important to remember that this dispatch was designed to praise Baldwin. Baldwin has become somewhat of a shadow, has been somewhat of a shadow, a fugitive and ill-born writer Stone announces. He then assures us that Baldwin's shadow is fast lengthening in the twilight of die-hard segregation, that little Jimmy Baldwin is achieving full stride, and in the flash of lightning that has followed the fire next time, he has suddenly become the American Negro's number one spokesman. I think it best here that we focus not so much on intention as need, the fugitive and ill-formed must be captured and normalized, praised, pressed to the service of forms of racial liberalism that might reiterate the most basic social and ideological structures of the dominant society. 
There's something telling about the fact that Stone continually references a diminutive Jimmy Baldwin. Little Jimmy, little Jimmy is a pixie growing into a not yet properly established manhood. Thus, there is still time for guidance, still room for proper definition. Indeed, Stone comes just short of suggesting that without some sort of policing and control, fallen celebrity might cause a fundamental threat. There is, in fact, a rapidly ascended cult being constructed around James Baldwin, he notes, a movement that sees his intellectual vigor as a step forward from the conditioned reflex action that has struck that has characterized much of the past civil rights movement among Negroes. Quoting a San Jose doctor, Stone goes on to inform us that civil rights has moved into an existential phase. That is to say, Baldwin's articulation, both the clarity of his speech and writing, as well as the limpness of his body, the prominence of his eyes, his sparing consumption of food, and stout intake of alcohol. All matters that Stone meticulously indexes in his profile suggest new forms of black subjectivity about which there can be no certainty and for which there are no standard means of appraisal. Baldwin's persona is treated, therefore, as not so much queer as monstrous, a thing trembling between past and present, the beautiful and the dreadful. Stone announces with equal measures of bravado and enmity that, quote, as a couple of Negro men watched Baldwin in action this week, one leaned across to the other and whispered, you know, he's the ugliest man I ever saw. With the thin cover of his never named black interlocutors in place, Stone proceeds to describe Baldwin as short and slight, with buggy eyes and a craggy plastic man face that he sees talks contorts into unimaginable crevices. Baldwin bounces, jitters, thrusts his head, this is now Stone. Baldwin bounces, jitters, thrusts his hands abruptly into his pockets and then waves them in the air. He is nervous and agile and light, but what he lacks in appearance, he surely makes up for in the nimbleness of his mind and the power of his speech. If he tends to overstate his case, it is perhaps his overwhelming zeal to get his message across, warm and possessive of an uncommon degree of humanity. Baldwin has a face that could soon be forgotten, not so his lengthening shadow as it steals across the nation. End quote. I would like to pause for a moment to note the resonance of Stone's description of Baldwin's speech, intellect, and body with similar descriptions of black subjectivity taken from popular culture, particularly the minstrel stage. To be sure, blackface minstrelsy was built upon the display of caricatures of black subjectivity and physicality in which the black was not figured, not only figured as a type that was physically awkward and ugly, with impossibly dark skin, unkempt woolly hair, and thick, often bright red lips, but also as a figure with a penchant for extreme and erratic forms of dress, movement, and dialect. I want to be careful, however, not to suggest that Roger Stone and the many other commentators whom I take him to represent were simply old-fashioned racists. Instead, I would have heard that the minstrel character was and is so fascinating precisely because of its modernity. 19th and 20th century blackface minstrelsy was directly concerned with what to make of the legion, legions of black individuals whose dress, speech, and public bearing demonstrated both movement away from the presumed simplicity and docility of their slave forebears and a desire to participate fully in the fast-paced changes in style and technology that are, simply, that are seemingly the greatest hallmarks of American as Eric Lott has capably demonstrated, the blackface minstrel confirmed equal measures of white antipathy and adoration, love and apprehension for African American subjectivity and culture. Fern Eggman, one of Baldwin's earliest biographers, offers a dramatic description of young Jimmy, James Baldwin's obsessive reading, 
and rereading of Harry Beecher Stowe's 1852 masterpiece, Uncle Tom's Cabin, a work that the young author famously critiqued and rejected in his groundbreaking 1949 essay, Everybody's Protest Novel. Ekman suggests that what so attracted Baldwin to Uncle Tom's Cabin was, quote, that stock figure, Topsy, who must have struck the boy as his feminine counterpart. She was exactly his age, and like him, a misfit, isolated, ridiculed, repugnant to those around her. She had his own round eyes, his own solemnity, his own quickness and keenness. She even learned to read as he had with magical speed, his own generosity and his own misery." End quote. I would add here that like Baldwin, Topsy was a figure whose affect and intellect suggest a creature who exists outside of time, who, one who, quote, never was born and who, quote, just grew that the character was a staple of the menstrual stage should itself demonstrate the American fascination and discomfort regarding the idea of a black subjectivity that cannot be easily assimilated to the prevailing logics of racial distinction. Moreover, as I've argued throughout, I'm not attempting to name some ancient reality, but instead a process that continues to dictate the ways in which we narrate black and queer subjectivity, both the celebrated and the same. <coughs> it is important, however, that we recognize that James Baldwin himself was very much aware of all of this. In the last interview of his life, he confessed to Quincy <coughs> Group that, quote, it's hard to be a legend. It's hard for me to recognize me. He spent a lot of time trying to avoid it. It's unbearable the way the world treats you, especially if you're black. And if you are not your, and you are not your legend, but you're trapped in it. The sobriety that we see on display in this quotation, the flat-footed acceptance of the fact that one enters into the public sphere via highly scripted and policed forms of interlocution, demonstrates habits of thought to which Baldwin had become accustomed, and which he and in which he actively participated from a very from very early in his career. In an autobiographical statement submitted to his publishers at Alfred A. Knopf in May 1953, on the verge of the release of his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, one sees the author struggling toward not only a theory of literature and the practice of writing, but also the matter of how one might function as an engaged black intellectual in, the com as, in so much in the common sense of American European life viciously resisted either accepting or even imagining such an aberration. From the very first sentence of the document, we find Baldwin seeming at once to resist and acquiesce to the deeply calcified narratives of black life that framed his own efforts as a novelist. The story of my childhood is the usual black fantasy, he begins. And we can dismiss it with the restrained observation that I certainly would not consider living it again. Reiterating the critique that he had offered four years earlier in everybody's protest novel, Baldwin complains that, quote, one of the difficulties about being a Negro writer is that the Negro problem is written about so widely. The bookshelves groan under the weight of information, and everybody therefore considers himself informed. And this information, furthermore, operates usually, generally, popularly, to reinforce traditional attitudes, end quote. That is to say, no matter the room into which the Negro writer walks, he is always imagined to be a known entity. Thus, his vocalizations can never be said to be discourse per se, but instead repetitions of deep and constant realities already adequately demonstrated by the very darkness of his body. Playing this particular game for all it's worth, Baldwin closes the statement by turning himself into a sort of cipher, one whose family story is the usual black fantasy. We find that the author has no particular interest other than food and drink, laughter and conversation, and a morbid desire to own a 16 millimeter camera. He likes neither Bohemia, nor those who are too earnest, but he does love America more than any other country in the world, no matter that in May of 1953, he was at the tail end of a more than eight year absence from his beloved homeland. Again, I find myself embarrassed by what I'm about to say. 
I would like to be able to demonstrate to you that the legacy of James Baldwin is one of unrelenting resistance to the discursive and ideological structures that I've attempted to demonstrate. In the end, however, I cannot imagine such an easy escape. If you believe, as I do, that white supremacy and woman hating are not aberrations, but instead deeply embedded aspects of American and indeed Western culture, then it becomes impossible to imagine any subject, any subjectivity, that is not already impacted and sullied by and within these same other structures. I will beg you for a bit more of your graciousness then, as I make but one more stop in the archive of celebrity, a popular biography, if you will, that I've been at pains to demonstrate. I turn to Baldwin's much underappreciated 1972 work, No Name in the Street, both because it represents, both because it is perhaps the closest thing to a fully realized autobiographical statement that he ever published, and because it is deeply flawed. I have in mind the arresting image that Baldwin provides of Dorothy Counts, one of four children who helped to integrate the Charlotte Mecklenburg public, the Charlotte Mecklenburg public school system in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, in 1957. In the fall of 1956, I was covering for Encounter, or for the CIA, National Conference of Black Writers and Artists at the Sorbonne in Paris. One bright afternoon, several of us, including the late Richard Wright, were meandering up the Boulevard Saint-Germain on the way to lunch. Much, if not most, of the group was African, and all of us, though some only legally, were black. Facing us on every newspaper on that wide, tree-shaded boulevard were photographs of 15-year-old Dorothy Counts being reviled and spat upon by the mob as she was making herself to take, making her way to school in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was unutterable pride, tension, and anguish in that girl's face as she approached the halls of learning with history jeering at her back. It made me furious. It filled me with both hatred and pity. And it made me ashamed. Some one of us should have been there with her. I dawdled in Europe for nearly yet another year, held by my private life and my attempt to finish a novel. But it was on that bright afternoon that I knew I was leaving France. I could simply no longer sit around in Paris discussing the Algerian and the black American problem. Everybody else was paying their dues, and it was time I went home and paid mine. Like James Baldwin, I'm profoundly moved by the images that were taken <coughs> of Dorothy Counts on the morning of September 4th, 1957, as she made her historic approach to the campus of Harding High School in Charlotte, North Carolina. Taking place on the same day that Daisy Bates led nine black students to the doors of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, Counts' presence on the near west side of Charlotte was designed to challenge resistance to the 1954 Brown versus Topeka Board of Education decision by using exceptional young black people as the vehicles by which to break the schoolhouse color line. One must make sense for the fact one must make sense, however, of the fact that Baldwin so seriously fumbled the details of his encounter with Counts' photograph. The Congress of Black Writers and Artists, an event that Baldwin styles a conference, was held in 1956, a year before Counts entered Harding High School. That is to say, though Baldwin undoubtedly meandered up the Boulevard Saint-Germain in the company of Richard Wright and other black notables, and though he was surely confronted by the remarkable photographs of Dorothy Counts' Noble March, these two events did not, in fact, take place on the same day. Instead, Baldwin produced a factually inaccurate, if perfectly serviceable memory, in which he demonstrated with piercing clarity the complexities of history and ideology that I'm now at pains to demonstrate. It is in this sense that I would ask us to examine the contours of our most precious aesthetic Structures. It is nearly impossible to stop looking at the at once unsettling 
and beautiful photograph of Dorothy taken by Don Stuckey of the Charlotte Observer. One is enthralled by the young woman's style, her remarkable composure, that great length of arms trailing delicately by her sides, her immaculately pressed hair, those reading glasses hanging nonchalantly about her neck, a tasteful red and yellow checked dress made especially for the day, but just slightly at a slender waist, only to burst into the exuberance of an overfull skirt. And even more remarkably, the young woman wears an immaculate cream-colored ribbon hanging half the length of her body, reminding even the dullest among us that the child had been prepared for either triumph or sacrifice. Or to state the matter slightly differently, Baldwin and the others who proclaimed accounts as heroism, understanding all too well the mechanic, understanding all too well the mechanics of publicity and publication, celebrity and celebration, did what it is seemingly inevitable for engaged intellectuals to do. They turned their precious subject into a shadow. Bent her striking image once again toward the status of man bearer in order to announce the very break with the vulgar protocols of racism and misogyny that the elegant young woman's singular march was designed to disrupt. My desire to write a biography of James Baldwin, including my willingness to announce his failures, the instances in which his work and his actions reiterated structures of feeling and thought that functioned to maintain hierarchies of race, gender, class, and sexuality, is motivated in no way by pessimism. Instead, nearly a quarter century after the publication of Orlando Patterson's masterful slavery and social death, I find myself fascinated by the question of what counts as social rebirth. Immersing myself in both the recently opened Baldwin archives, as well as the competing ideological, social, and discursive structures that underwrite Baldwin's legacy, I find, I find that the name Baldwin so attracts and perplexes because it marks a spot at which a remarkable intellect and a singular life have slipped the yoke, become unruly, if not fully uncontrollable, restricted but not tamed, buried but not dead. Baldwin's biography is best approached not as a thing, but as an unsettled process in which the grand authority exhibited in Baldwin's prose and oratory is continually challenged by both admirers and detractors alike. Thus the theoretical question that must stand at the center of Baldwin's studies is how we might make sense of the fact of a black intellectual who, though interred decades before, still resists easy consumption. Nigger, shadow, genus, intellectual, Baldwin never quickly, quite properly inhabits any of these identities. Instead, he bequeathed us the gift of radical uncertainty, the promise of revolutionary discomfort. Thank you very much. So we do have time for questions. If you uh, ask, please uh, uh, let our uh, camera person here record your question. Um, uh, do we have some questions here? I could go first, but it would be rude. Yeah. I have a question. I have, yes, I have no yes, such yes. qualms. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a lot of thoughts, um, some of which I can ask you about later. Um, but uh, one that occurred to me when you were talking about the archive in particular mm -hmm. was, you may not know this, but I'm a medievalist, so I'm very interested in the archives the of people. space. Right, yeah, yeah we, we love it. Um, and so um, I wanted to ask you, in light of uh, scholarful Carolyn Dinshaw's idea of, she calls the archive the queer touch of the past. Mm -hmm. She talks about the ways in which the archive makes the past present and also in some ways takes us into the past. Right. She talks about this kind of moment of, uh, of kind of radical uncertainty in the 
uh, in the touch of the archival material. Right. So I wanted kind of in light of that to ask you what your experience in the archive with these papers was like. Right. Um, um, well, there's two parts of it. One is that I already told the thing about the. I um, I have one of my set stories is telling that story about when losing the battle with my mother over uh, over time because <laughs> um, she would like that. Um, but part of the experience, I will say, um, I'll, I'll answer um, in two ways. Part of the experience is that I can't is that there's no photographing, so I'm just there for long periods. So right. it really is an actual like you're just sitting in this chair for a very very long time. And literally, I'm there sometimes for hours, so I sit the chair really low and put my head on the desk and all sorts of crazy stuff because I'm just there. It's, it takes me a long time to go through it. Um, so the, one of the things that you're experiencing is that you have, um, and also he's a very, well, he's a very fine writer in everything that he does, including the massive amount of uh, letters that there are. So you have the experience of reading on, uh, a person, if you're interested in writing, it, you have the experience of reading a person's writing is quite uh, remarkable. Now, but to speak to the, I think the better to the spirit of your question, um, the other thing about um, dealing with this archive is that it was wildly well prepared. So um, it was prepared before Baldwin's death by his um, uh, um, assistant, David Leeming. And um, so it's incredible attention has been, to, been made to his self-presentation. So the sort of fantasy of, oh my gosh, we're going to see this, uh, yeah, we're going to see this secret thing about James Baldwin um, is actually just not part of that archive. It's an archive that he went through meticulously and that there were years of um, back and forth about who was going to actually receive them. And the way in which those, um, those materials were actually received, the literal, no, not the literal boxes, but the, the, um, the divisions, are still being used by the library. So um, you get this very, um, very, the queerness of it is that you get this very, very, very well prepared. Um, very straight up. Right, this is a very well prepared. <laughs> Um, legacy that this person has produced of himself about this is how we this is how I would like you to read um, my life from beginning to end, um, including um, for example the thing that people sort of freak out about it is that it has I think all of the manuscripts and all and multiple versions of all of the manuscripts um, in it so you see them develop over time, and so um, it's a little tricky on that and the level that you see you find yourself being a, a bit guided. Um, I, made, I joked with um, Robert and the folks that I had lunch with this afternoon that one of the things that I don't have of uh, thus is any salacious stuff about um, James Baldwin. Like if, he, if I knew anything about James Baldwin's sex life, drug life, blah, 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 you would know now. You know? I would it's totally too early to tell them that. Just I, I know. It's hard to tell. The good stuff's coming. I would totally love He's it. He's kidding. I would totally. For one thing, I'm a gossip, so I'd be like, oh my god, I've got to have had sex and did drugs with James Baldwin. I would tell. Everybody would know already. Um, and so, um, so that stuff just doesn't exist in it. And then the other thing about it is that the handling of it is very real. And so. Um, not only the no photographing and no copying, but the private set of letters between him and his brother and two, I think, four of his closest friends are also restricted for another 20 years. So most of it we have access to, but the stuff that actually would get to uh, the sort of love affair part of things, if that's, if that's what you're interested in, is, um, is one of the things that is, is actually quite restricted. I will say about that, I rather, I'm happy with that. You know, that I'm, that doesn't bug me. I'm much more interested in the question of why it is that we're so interested in knowing that type of personal stuff about um, about our author's life. I'm as much of a gossip as anybody, um, but you know, part of the issue is that what do you really gain from the from the reading of it? And so, I'm much more interested in using the archive to talk about Baldwin and also Baldwin's uh, and and Baldwin's reception and what what use that figure actually does. The other thing I'll say to you about it is that he's obsessed with his um, with the way in the archives and way in which he's being figured in the public. So he's so all the stuff about oh my gosh he's been called ugly and fay and hysterical and this and that he's commenting on continually through the whole of his career, um, and so it's a it's a it's a painful thing for him um, to have people talk about him in that way. But it's a painful thing that is mainly um, represented in his letters and in things that are not meant to be seen and were not meant to be seen during his life, but he's super aware of. And then you then read the stuff that he does in public to understand oh he's, he's actually fighting against it in, in, in some ways as well. So if you've seen I'm Not Your Negro, he has this very centurion uh, mode of speaking um, that can't have sounded like what he uh, grew up speaking like um, in 
on 133rd Street in Harlem. And there's a reason for that. You know, there's a thing that one has to do in order to be a public intellectual. This, there, there are um, suits that one has to put on them to do that. Please. Yes, um, thank you for being Please speak loudly so everyone can hear you. Sorry. You want me to do it? No, I'm, 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 I can do it. Um, I was wondering to what extent could we consider this particular archive when working on uh, tradition, uh, tradition that we inherit, but when also the travels. And I'm also reading it in the context of an Arab intellectual context, you mentioned the question of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It was very much part of this particular conversation. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm just wondering, what do we make of this tradition, one that travels, that travels to Paris, but also through Paris, to other parts of the world, but what remains of this particular tradition that you started excavating? You do, um, and you're asking specifically about um, uh, James Baldwin in North Africa, James yes. Baldwin in... Well, it's interesting, um, because one of the things that actually surprises me a lot um, I'll add to this in two ways too. Um, one of the things that surprises me a lot about it is that there is not, and there hasn't been very much treatment of the fact of James Baldwin um, as um, there's been some treatment of James Baldwin as an internationalist, but he's thought of as being the quintessential American writer. But in fact, much of his life was spent out of the country, um, and um, he's thought he's not thought of in uh, sort of francophone. Uh, orbits at all. Um, so people don't think of James Baldwin as a print intellectual. And even though he's, you know, um, was a contemporary, for example, with Franz Fanon and Lid, they lived very close to each other for a long while, and a whole set of uh, French intellectuals, including black French intellectuals and Arab French intellectuals, there's very little work that has been done on that. Um, the work that has been done is on the fact that James Baldwin spent 10 years back and forth between Istanbul. Um, and so I know that Turks are, in fact, working now, uh, progressive people, progressive Turks are working to reclaim part of Baldwin as part of the Turkish tradition because Baldwin actually um, uh, directed a play in Istanbul and was very, very connected with a modern um, Turkish um, community that was around in the 1960s. What I think of as being his finest work, um, Another Country, was actually written in Istanbul. Um, so, um, what I can say is that, that, thinking about the tradition, I think that there's been um, um, little of it done about James Walden's connection to both the Arab world and, um, and generally the African diasporic world. He's thought of as being specifically African American with African American meaning, um, very specific things that it didn't, that, and, and having a very positive conception of life. Um, he often talked, interestingly enough, about one thing I don't like to, um, uh, with James Walden is he talks a lot about the South, and in fact, the Southern. Um, and so he talks about the South and the United States as if it's a place um, versus um, as if it's a huge region of the country that's very, that's very, very distinct. And, but it's, all, it's a very good narrative of what African-American life is, a movement north to south thing, but actually it's not the truth of all African-American people. Now, this gets to the second part of it. The archive exists at the Schomburg Center for Research on, uh, on Black Culture. Um, and the Schomburg Center for Research on Black Culture is a um, truly fine archive in New York City. Uh, and if you get a chance to use those materials, use those materials. But that is about, that is the heart of African American obsession with we've got to reclaim our history and we have to, we have to uh, care for our past. It's very much um, um, a uh, pen and ink archive, um, and it's very much an archive about images. And so the fact that there was a huge debate about whether or not James Walton's paper should go to the Schumburg Center or whether or not they should go to, to Yale University. Um, and part of the reason to go to the Schomburg Center was that it recentered his history within a very traditional way of thinking about African American life and history. Now, I'm a huge fan of the Schomburg Center, and this, uh, the folks who work there have been unbelievably gracious to me, um, and I owe pe individual people there a lot. At the same time, it's very clear to me that part of the placing of, of Baldwin at um, the Schomburg Center is about a very specific narrative of what type of intellectual he actually was. Um, and a very specific version of what African American identity actually actually means. Now, I'll tell you a funny thing about Schomburg, uh, just about um, the craziness of New York City and the craziness of, um, uh, of the demographics of the country. So this is, the Schomburg is on 135th, on Linux Avenue on 135th Street. So if any of you know the Harlem Renaissance, this is, that is where it happened. Um, and, but it's still a very, very black area, although Harlem now is now majority black, um, but not, I can do this. The plurality of persons who live in Harlem Har Har are, uh, are black persons, but not the majority. So, um, so that's already a massive change. Um, but it's interesting, the area is a very black uh, area of the city, but it's not an Anglo-black area of the city. 
It's, it's very much dominated by Dominican, Puerto Rican, Cuban people, dark-skinned Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban people. So one of the things that the Schomburg is going through is that this zone um, that is seen as being the center of black life uh, in the country continues to be a center of black life in the country, but not the, the center of black life in the country that it was when, when the library was actually founded. And the native language of the, of the average person walking into the library is no longer English. And so it's sort of Spanglish, New York stuff uh, that is actually part of the <coughs> city. So I, I, the, I can say, I can't speak directly to the tradition stuff, but I can say that the mechanics of how we think about tradition are being, um, are, have been thought through with James Baldwin a lot. But James Baldwin is sort of a messy figure, and the places in which James Baldwin um, has been taken in order to um, deal with the mechanics of that are actually themselves dynamic. Mm -hmm. So the question of what that what that uh, archive will actually look like um, uh, 10 years from now and what that neighborhood will look like 10 years from now is still a question. The light's going to come back in on then 32 seconds, I think. <laughs> uh, do we have uh, other questions? Obviously, if uh, God is merciful, the lights will come back on, as they usually do. It's me talking bad about James Baldwin. The guy was like, what are you, what are you doing here? And yeah, no, I'm not even bad about James Baldwin. I love James Baldwin. It's, it's a, being a, you blew me with your traditional question. So I think I <laughs> well, will you talk about James Baldwin within the context of uh, some of these other writers that you were talking about in terms of uh, Ralph Ellison and uh, Gwendolyn Brooks and Lorraine Hansberry and uh, Richard Wright? Uh, you know, I thought that was, uh, you really hammered it home. Uh, you know, this has some version of of this has been said in many ways by ma many different people. But that's a particular moment, and a group of people are very aware of each other. Um, you know, every one of the people that I mentioned when I did that thing of you know um, uh, that what you see is uh, William Shawn saying this is the first time a Negro has actually said these things, and it's just like what are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, black people refuse to stop saying this in every particular, in every instance in which they can say it. Say, you know, stop the, basically stop the segregation and stop our whole police violence. We would like to go to work, and uh, we would like to have um, proper housing and some health care. You know, and um, those sentences are have in fact not stopped yet. Um, the difference between Baldwin and all of the people whom I name, though, is that he was the young, young, the young upstart in all of that. And so the part of what you have to remember about it for him is how early his career actually begins. So he's writing um, for the major um, uh, literary magazines in the country um, as a person not older, not too much older than the students who are at AUB now, and certainly not older than the graduate students at AUB. Um, and, and so one of the things that's going on is that I think with them is that they think that this is a new, sort of more harsh, um, more rhetorically harsh, but perhaps less angry um, version of black identity, one that can actually be named and dealt with in some ways that, that, um, that older versions of, uh, of black um, intellectuals couldn't in some ways. So I think that that's the, that's the way that that goes. The funny thing about it is that the group of people that I named, they didn't like each other that much. They really, really, really didn't. And so, you know, there was definitely between um, sort of Ralph Ellison and James Walden uh, a sort of, um, what's, what's this for the magnets? Negative magnets? Positive magnets? I know, okay. The, the magnets uh, the, the magnets that refuse to tell each other. What is it? Thank you, sorry. <laughs> uh, the magnet, this is the magnet. This is attraction. Right. This is a um, similar pole. Right. <laughs> this is the. Um, Universal sign for magnetic propulsion. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, the, they, cer they certainly were not um, so chummy. And also, the interesting thing about James Baldwin, I think we're forgetting, this actually is about how um, where he fits in in terms of um, our tradition, is that he's cut his teeth on um, downtown West Village, um, um, largely um, Jewish and um, Eastern European immigrant intellectual life of the 1960s. He didn't, even though he's born in Harlem, he's not of the Harlem of Langston Hughes. He just is not. And he's very, very hard, he uh, reviews Langston Hughes in 1958, and he's very harsh with Hughes about the fact that he thinks that Hughes is sort of old fashioned. Please, sir. Um, I know you said you don't have a lot of salvation to go about his sexual life. You're asking for Do you 
<laughs> but I find it uh, really interesting that uh, I guess Giovanni's room comes out in the late 50s. Yes. And soon after that, he makes his way to Istanbul. You talked a little bit about Istanbul. And yeah. I'm fascinated by this chapter of his life because we, maybe because we want to play him. Because we what? Because I play. feel like the role play. that he's in, in this particular moment in his life is really interesting. I mean, Giovanni's room is kind of like a coming of age, maybe a coming out moment. Mm -hmm. or, for Baldwin, and so is there a relationship between that, you know, the appearance of that novel and his going to Istanbul, you know, the city of the world's desire, et cetera, et cetera? I think the, actually the better way to even ask your question is, why is it that he publishes a novel called Another Country in Another, well, he's, why does he write another, <laughs> called a novel called Another Country, always in another country? And um, look, you know, I don't know. So I, you know, this is how this I'll, I'll now reveal the the great strength of my career. I don't know. Thus, I will go on and on and on about it. Um, and, uh, and and that is that I don't quite know the answer to this question. However, it does seem to me that one of the things that Baldwin is clear that he needs to get out of uh, the United States in order to finally publish a novel. And it, he then is clear that he needs to get out of France in order to move to the next uh, stage of his career. And that's what the Istanbul thing actually is. And I think that what that means is that he needs to get outside of what are recognizable U.S. and um, to only a slightly lesser extent um, Western European conceptions of uh, racial division and racial identity, frankly, and sexual identity for him. And so the part of what you get, when part of what he gets in France and then he really gets in these and in his symbol is people who are looking at him as strange, but it's a strangeness that is specific to him that there's not a clearly identified uh, sort of narrative about how it is, what it is that he's doing there, especially since by the time he actually arrives in Istanbul, he's arriving as an elite person, and he's definitely being treated well and definitely um, doing all sorts of things. Now, I will, in fact, um, I don't have, I have not uncovered this salacious thing uh, on my own, um, but David Lehman tells us that Baldwin um, was uh, um, fag while he was in, while he was in Turkey, um, and we know this did not to be true. And he certainly was having sex with men while he was there as well. And so the part of what's happening for him is that he's, but another country is not a novel that's about the articulation of a very clear gay identity, but it's definitely a novel that's about wanting people to actually have a broader conception of, of who they are, to not get trapped within what you would think of as being traps of uh, race thinking, traps of gender thinking. That's it. That's the bad part. <laughs> And that's my one salacious thing. That's my one salacious thing. That's all. That's all I have. Any drink alone, alcohol. <laughs> Please. You spoke um, about um, the way that that Baldwin kind of resisted the dominant theologies of the day. We mm -hmm. also talked about the way that he didn't. That he yeah. 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 Could you talk a little bit about that? You know, one of the things that happens to James Baldwin uh, from. Um, is after, literally after he comes back to, so I give the Dorothy Counts thing, right? And part of what happens with the Dorothy Counts thing, if I just may go back for a second, part of the reason it bugs me um, with James Baldwin, and by the way, I'm from the city, yeah. so, um, and by the way, I know, the thing is, I know she's actually called Mother Count. Do you know what I'm saying? So she's like a person that you very much you know, to like too. If you're really if you're a certain type of black person from from you just are like very nice to this woman. Um, but this is what irritates me about. It. I'll tell you what irritates me about the image is that he ends with the whole idea, and this is what irritates me about James Baldwin thinking about Southerners. Um, he irritates. Um, it, it bugs me that he says some one of us should have been there. Um, and it sort of um, begins with this idea that, you know, one day young Dorothy woke up and decided that she was just going to enter a graduate school. It's like, no. Um, there had been a selection process. And so, um, actually, four African American students um, um, entered the public schools in Charlotte that day. Um, and, um, um, and at four different schools, they had been selected. And so, they, you know, you, you get who was selected. They had to have the best possible schools, they had to have the best possible families. And so her parents, her father is a um, university professor at Johnson C. Smith University, which is a historically black university. And that's, the father, that's her father? No. The thing about it, the thing about that image is that Dorothy Counts is a dark-skinned young woman, or my complexion, a um, young person. Um, and so, um, so what they did was that, um, that they got 
that man to follow her because he's so fair that, it, that people did not recognize fully that that was a black person with her. So the part of the deal is that um, the image itself is saying, oh my gosh, someone, some, one of us should have been there. This guy is there to be there, not be there, be there, not be there as part of the thing. And that people even in this thing, don't, um, uh, even in the, when it was published in the newspapers, didn't see this as a black man who's following her. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that sort of bugs me on that. Um, to go to directly to the question that you've done is that he then comes back to the states as a civil rights a spokesperson for civil rights. And so, um, you know, the, um, his, the first ever um, um, uh, film of one of his novels is about to be published at the Old Fink of Tom. Um, uh, excuse me, it's about to be, a film that's just been made of it, it's just come out now. Um, but it's the most conservative of his novels, and so it's, a, it's the only one that has an actual fully functioning heterosexual uh, belt story at the center of it. I think that part of what happens with Baldwin is that he tries um, later in his life to become an individual who is producing a socially useful um, aesthetic, and so he changes. And he wants to be not simply a sort of, um, he's not simply a young man who is attempting to do, um, to press against boundaries um, at the, uh, by the time he becomes a middle-aged guy. By the time he becomes a middle-aged guy, my sense is that part of what he is attempting to do is to produce um, both language and literature that's useful to the civil rights movement as, it, as it's framed. And the civil rights movement as it's framed in the 1960s is the civil rights movement um, that is dominated by Martin Luther King and a certain type of respectability politics. Even with um, Malcolm X, um, who is producing um, a sort of, and who, you know, visited AUV, um, even Malcolm X, who is, um, and I think that that's what happens with James Baldwin as well, although he struggles with it the whole of his career. He struggles with being able to produce a, a literature that's actually workable while also not believing fully that the way in which we talk about um, race, class, gender, sexuality is actually functional. Baldwin, uh, by the way, the, one of the ways in which Baldwin is a difficult uh, person for us to consume today is that he never would have used the language of being a gay person, although he often talked about being a person uh, who had romantic relationships with men. So that part of the deal is that he very much was uh, resistant to the idea that um, sexual identity should be, um, in fact, social identity. Um, so I'm not sure um, what I think about that. It's not my job to, to judge that in any way. But certainly he was a guy who was um, who had to play both sides of that, of that field, I think. Yes, um, anything? Uh, yes, well, Please. Shukri gets the final word here. Please. Yeah, that sounds like the beginning of a modernist poem. <laughs> My question is simple. Uh, I just wanted to know if he had the relationship, like kind of, um, with the Martin King, Luther King, and uh, Malcolm X. How was their relationship? Were they close or? This is a very. It's actually, uh, you know, the one of the things. The other thing that the um, um, way in which I have. Uh, my career does well is that I realize that anytime someone starts a sentence with my question is simple, it's a trap. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Do not believe that. Um, the truth of the matter is that the answer is super complicated um, in that he had a fond relationship with um, both uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, he actually had probably a better relationship with Malcolm X. Um, in that um, Malcolm X really liked um, the way that in which James Baldwin sort of would wither the crowd. And James Baldwin was also very, uh, very attracted to that to, uh, with Malcolm X. Um, and then with Martin Luther King, I think that their relationship was um, respectful and much cooler. Now, um, I, I don't know if you have seen um, I'm Not Your Negro, um, but one of the things is that um, Raoul Peck was able to get um, uh, what um, an unpublished piece of writing by James Baldwin, in which James Baldwin um, uh, talks about um, his mourning of uh, Martin Luther King, his friend, um, Malcolm X, his friend, and also Medgar Evers, um, who was an NAACP um, leader who was killed in Mississippi. And so the relations were quite good, even though this was a guy who, in, with all three of those gentlemen, should not really have had a relationship with, with, um, with any three of them. Even if you get past the question of James Baldwin's um, sexuality, James Baldwin was a sort of a bohemian intellectual, but all of them really sort of liked him, and uh, all of them um, uh, depended on him um, in, for some type of intellectual sustenance and also some, uh, for some type of personal sustenance as well. So basically, it was quite good. And remarkable, can you imagine? Uh, 
that, um, that he knew all of these men, and um, they, they were all um, kind to each other, is the way to say it. Thank you. In a way, the writers learned. In a way, the writers are not <laughs> yeah. um, Thank you all. Uh,